Uh, my name is Paul Laronde. I'm the, as uh, Glenn mentioned, the Tag and Technology Manager at the Canadian Cattle Identification Agency. Uh, my presentation is uh, entitled Making Standards and Technology Work. I want to give you a little bit of uh, insight into how uh, uh, standardization of tags and readers happen in Canada. And uh, we'll uh, start with a, a quick overview of my slide deck. I want to talk about traceability a little bit uh, about our agency. Um, my background, which will go fairly quick now, uh, talk about what is a standard uh, in, in relationship to um, uh, tags and, and technology, talk about how uh, this, these standards are implemented uh, in Canada uh, through uh, the um, uh, various mechanisms that we have in place, uh, talk about a technology statement uh, with regards to uh, our agency, and a little bit about the International Organization for Standards, uh, uh, low frequency and on UHF, and uh, talk about value of standards. So I got to say thank you to Ms. Leanne uh, for doing the Go Team Go on the standardizing uh, uh, a ID and readers. So I'll, I will uh, fall in line with that. <clears throat> um, so I want to start with a definition of traceability. Yeah, so when, when we talk in, in groups like this, uh, people who are familiar with traceability, everybody's definition is just a little bit different. And, and I just wanted to uh, talk about from where I'm coming from so we have a common understanding. And the, the definition I got up on the screen there, the ability to follow an item uh, or group of items to be it uh, animal, plant, uh, food product, or ingredient from one point in the supply chain to another, either backwards or forwards, is the definition that we use in Canada. That is the Canadian uh, Food Inspection Agency's uh, definition, and it is also uh, the International Standards Organization uh, definition for traceability. So uh, I've seen sort of fluffier ones. I've seen more succinct ones, but um, when I talk about <coughs> traceability, uh, that's, this is uh, the sort of basis that, uh, or the place I'm coming from. So who is the Canadian Cattle Identification Agency? We are a not-for-profit agency in Canada. We are uh, producer-initiated. We are producer-run. And uh, our board uh, is comprised of uh, all industry people. And uh, these are folks who are uh, engaged at the... Uh, uh, the, the producer level, so they all have uh, poop on their boots, so to speak, and uh, so they get it. They are, uh, we are the responsible administrator in Canada for uh, cattle, sheep, and bison, and uh, that means that uh, um, we have a memorandum of understanding with the government, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, and that uh, memorandum outlines what our duties and responsible, uh, responsibilities are. So <clears throat> we operate at the pleasure of CFIA. The data, data privacy is one of our cornerstones, and uh, our producers uh, uh, are, are always remind us that uh, uh, privacy is the, is the ultimate uh, uh, goal within our, uh, our group as we house data. It's not our data. The data belongs to producers. If producers want to share it, they can share it if they please. Uh, we are just the keeper. I got a little uh, a star besides uh, goats and cervids. So in Canada, goats and cervids are moving into the traceability realm. Uh, there's new regulations uh, on the horizon, and uh, we don't know exactly what's in them, but we do know that uh, goats and cervids will become regulated uh, in this new system, and uh, uh, we'll be, we're already selling tags for them uh, in that, uh, uh, for that system. <clears throat> So as I mentioned, we do data management, uh, we do data collection, uh, we, we have core data that we collect uh, for, that supports traceability. We have um, uh, value-added data, so uh, age uh, verification, birth dates uh, for uh, folks who want to collect that. Uh, there's some vaccination programs set up in there, so uh, linked to the national number. Uh, we run a tag program, uh, so we approve tags uh, for, for Canada, and uh, we also run a, a tag store uh, where we have uh, the ability to sell tags directly to producers. So we still maintain a retail network uh, for producers who prefer that route, but we do offer uh, an option for producers to buy tags directly from uh, the agency. 
we, we went down that road to help with data integrity. There's just less hands in the pot when it comes to uh, um, uh, issuing out tag numbers to producers' accounts. So this is a shorter uh, route, and uh, the data piece is, uh, is, is uh, better. We run a transceiver program, approval program as well. Uh, so we test and uh, um, make sure that readers meet uh, minimum specification uh, for our uh, uh, program. So Glenn covered most of this stuff off. Um, actually, he hit them all pretty close right on. So like he said, I've known uh, Glenn for, for a long time, uh, probably 25 years in the ID business and traceability. Uh, I was the first uh, traceability coordinator for the pr province of Ontario, and uh, my first day on the job was the day that BSC was announced. So, <clears throat> so hit the hit the road running. I've been the tag and technology manager at CCIA for around coming on to 10 years now, and uh, I'm also the not the but a representative at the International Standards Organization uh, Working Group Three, which is uh, the group that sets standards for electronic animal identification. So I want to talk about what is a standard uh, and how do standards help us. So if you, if you think about your bank card and you travel to the other side of the world and you stick your card into a machine and ask it for money, there's a bit of delay and some flashing lights, but you get money out of there if you have money. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we just take that for granted. But in the background, there's a whole bunch of processes happening, and some of those processes are governed by standards. And... Um, it, it's, it's not magic, it's uh, these processes that are, are all linked together that communicate across the globe and let you take money out of your account, uh, you know, at a different location. Uh, dashboard symbols, uh, you know, you rent a car in a different country, the, the dashboard is not in your native language, but, you know, some of the little symbols are very familiar. The little, the little windshield wiper is pretty universal. The, the headlight symbol is pretty universal. The little fan on the defrost is, is universal. So you don't need to read everything, but you can, you can make things happen. So, and, and from a manufacturing process, I'm sure that's, there's some advantages that from the manufacturing perspective that if they just have to make one little light button and one little horn button for all their cars in the world, it's better than having one for each country. So... Um, MPEG video, another example that's sort of an everyday example. You can uh, go to your favorite website, uh, click on a video, and download it onto your computer. If it's an MPEG video and you have an MPEG player with the right codec, you can play that, that video seamlessly because the player and that uh, video uh, that has been encoded is done to a certain standard, and it, it just works magically in the background. We just take it for uh, granted that, you know, technology has solved these, these problems. But, in fact, standards play uh, a big role uh, in day-to-day -day life um, uh, internationally. So I think uh, talking about the definition of a standard is also important. Uh, ISO has some training modules, so I've, I've lifted this out of that training module. I'm giving them credit at the bottom there. But their definition uh, that a, a standard is a document established by consensus and approved by a recognized body that provides for common and repeated use. Uh, rules and guidelines are characteristics for activities or the results aimed at the achievement uh, of the optimum degree of order in a given context. So I've underlined a few words in there. So consensus is important. Uh, recognized body is important. Uh, rules, guidelines, and characteristics. So standards are useless if they're uh, implemented in the dark or in the closet. Uh, there needs to be consensus about a standard. It needs to work for the vast majority of people who are engaging uh, that standard. And if it doesn't, then it will fail. So... Um, the International Standards Organization is one organization that develops standards. And at Working Group 3, there's people from uh, around the world at that table discussing the problems uh, that the standard is hoping to solve from their perspective. So it's, uh, uh, it's easy to think that you, have, uh, you could design your own standard and it's going to work for you, but it, it's not going to work for everyone. General, in general terms, uh, standards are voluntary agreements developed within an open process that gives all stakeholders, including consumers, the opportunity to express their views and, those, and have those views considered. Um, 
again, voluntary agreements, uh, open process, uh, and all stakeholders. So the common theme there is that uh, it, it's, it's groups uh, that are interested in, in, in that sector who uh, work together to develop uh, standards. Okay. Um, talk a little bit about approved indicators, uh, identifiers in Canada. We have a whole bunch of different names. We call them tags, we call them indicators, we call them uh, um, uh, identifiers. So it's, uh, it's, it's, we use those words interchangeably. So I pardon, pardon me if I switch back and forth. So cattle, sheep, and bison in Canada, uh, approved indicators are uh, RFID, and, and in brackets here I got outside Quebec. Quebec is a province within Canada where uh, they run their own traceability system. They still use the same standard of tags uh, as the rest of the country, so they are you know, uh, uh, able to operate uh, in, uh, smoothly uh, within the system, but um, they do run their own system. Uh, goats and cervids will have uh, RFID and VID tags, uh, which are visual tags, uh, when, they are, when they are approved. When I talk about low frequency tags, I'm talking about the 134.2, the ISO standard. Uh, all, all our identifiers in our system uh, are using that particular standard. Specifically, um, looking at the ISO standards, there's three main ones that, that uh, support the platform that we use. So 11784, 11785, and 24683. So 784, 785 define the code structure in the tag and the tag and the communication with the tag and the reader. So that, that ensures that all tags in the system can be read by all readers in the system. Um, this is the same system used by uh, some of our trading pa uh, partners. Uh, uh, Australia uses the uh, ISO platform for their identification program. Uh, some of the tags in the U.S., the 840 tags, are, uh, uh, meet this standard as well. So uh, it's, a, it's, it's one of the only standards out there for uh, animal ID uh, globally. The 24683 uh, defines the testing procedures uh, for conformance to 11.784.785. In the picture uh, is an example of the tags that uh, we use in Canada. It's, it's, uh, there's nothing special about that one. It was a picture I had handy, but they're, they're round female transponders with round male studs. Uh, uh, all the tags uh, look similar, um, but they're all different. So we have five different manufacturers uh, who produce eight of the approved tags we use in, in uh, our system. And uh, although they uh, are all all work uh, uh, seamlessly in the system they're technically all different so uh, there could be different technology in there there could be different plastic in there there's different locking mechanisms in there um, there's different markings on them so each manufacturer can have their unique spin on on that tag but the technology piece when it talks to the reader uh, is exactly the same because they're using that uh, meeting that standard I think it's important to talk about, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about UHF, and um, when we talk about technology in Canada, uh, our agency is about the data, uh, the technology on getting the data into our uh, system uh, is, is, is not necessarily our concern. Um, we are technology neutral. If something better, faster, slicker shows up, uh, you know, we will uh, obviously look at that. Uh, we have a mechanism in place for uh, technology providers to bring new technology to the table. Um, the, the, the bar's fairly steep if you want to change the entire system. We need to look at a cost-benefit analysis of, of the, the new technology being implemented over the existing uh, uh, platform that's there now. So it's... Um, uh, it's, it's doable, and we're always open to new and fresh ideas. 
Uh, however, uh, you need to make sure that it's, it's, there's going to be value there for, for uh, our clients uh, and for uh, the government. Uh, governments spent uh, and, and industry spent substantial amount of money putting readers in place in, in places like auction markets and feedlots and on farm and to um, you know, s switch gears and, and, and pivot into a different technology, making you know, that investment uh, nil uh, would be taken quite seriously. So we talked about this approved uh, uh, identifiers and uh, the standards. So standards are implemented, or the uh, approvals are implemented in Canada uh, through a, a, a group uh, called the uh, uh, NIDMAC group. So it's a joint government industry committee uh, of stakeholders that sit around the table and uh, are, are participants in our, in our system. So whether they're provincial governments, federal government, uh, um, breed associations, uh, species groups, uh, folks that have a stake in, in, the, in that game are sitting at that table. This uh, uh, identification uh, device methodology committee is an advisory group. It advises the government on all matters related to the tags and traceability uh, uh, in Canada. And uh, one of the outputs of this committee is a document called an approval framework. So it's the animal identifier approval and revocation framework. This framework is the basis for uh, approval of uh, tags in Canada. It's also the, the basis for the revocation of approved tags in Canada. So uh, the, um, uh, as an agency, uh, sort of safeguarding uh, the, the, the tags and, and the technology piece, we test uh, all the tags in the system every year, year and a half, to make sure that they still meet that minimum criteria of, uh, for performance and, con and conformance, to make sure that it's the same tag that, that is in the market that was approved originally, and that uh, there's no issues with that tag. So um, the framework is, can be handed off to uh, any testing lab uh, that will uh, uh, that has the capability to do testing, so we require a gold standard ICAR test lab to be able to do our testing, and um, the the methodology, the, the the specifications, and everything are outlined in that framework document. The document's on our website. Uh, it's on the CFIA website. You can download it. It's uh, 50 pages of not that interesting reading, um, and it outlines exactly what's expected of your uh, device. Uh, if you want to sell it in Canada. So I had a gentleman from South America approach me who is a tag manufacturer. He was very proud of his product. And um, he says, I want to sell my tag in your country. Maybe not as good English as that, but essentially that's what he'd asked. And uh, so I offered him this document. And a couple days later, he contacted me and he says, what is minus 35? <laughs> what does that mean? And I said, that is, <laughs> that is the temperature that your tag has to work at. And, he's <laughs> and he had no concept of what minus 35 was. <laughs> and I haven't heard from him since. So <laughs> it's, it's all. And then the other side I get is, who the heck tags at minus 35? Uh, there's some you know, vendors that are, are bitter that think they should you know, be able to partake in our system, uh, but they don't want to have to meet that criteria. So... You know, their opinion is we should just be able to sell tags freely in the market and, and you know, the, the market will decide which are the best tags. And it's like, no, that would be, that'd be more mayhem than we have now. So I, I got enough mayhem. Transceivers, um, we do test and approve uh, transceivers. So transceivers are the scanners, the tag scanners. We have uh, mobile scanners, handhelds, and uh, stationary ones that, you know, go into, uh, into larger facilities. Uh, I have approves in, uh, in quotes. The, uh, uh, it's an internal test. It's not, uh, it's not a, a, a legal uh, piece at all. You can sell your reader all day long in Canada uh, without having this approval. It's an internal standard governed or administered by the Technical Advisory Committee. The Technical Advisory Committee is a uh, um, standing committee uh, with our board of directors. And uh, we, we have testing performed by a, a competent testing lab. Uh, and, and we test, the, our, our main, the main uh, points in testing are that 
Uh, a, it works with all the approved tags. We got to make sure that it, it, it is functional. Believe it or not, we've had readers show up that doesn't work with all the tags. Um, we, we have a minimum read range set for each style of reader so that, uh, you know, we've had folks show up with these little, those, those little, uh, when you used to have slots in your little handhelds and it was like a little slot reader and um, it had like a one inch read range and and of course they failed the three inch minimum and they demanded that we change the standard so they could get into the marketplace so and that didn't happen <laughs> um, the, uh, the 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 main reason for approving uh, having this list of approved readers it's on our website you can see which readers are approved and which ones aren't uh, is to give the government some guidance. So government hands out subsidies uh, in, some, in some cases for reading equipment to support traceability. And uh, there's just too many slick reader salesmen out there talking to the bureaucrats and they get them all confused uh, about their readers and, and uh, how applicable they are. So we basically have a list and if it's on the list, then they'll write them a check, and if you're not on the list, then you get to go home and explain to the producer that your reader's not subsidized. Uh, the other pieces that we check for are uh, compliance with electrical safety. So a lot of times readers will come in with a, uh, uh, you know, uh, an imported uh, power supply. So it doesn't meet Canadian standards, and uh, in fact, some of them are fire hazards. And they figure that they, they buy the most, the most inexpensive one they have. It works. Here's my reader. But um, it, it, there, there's a number of caveats around that. So we demand certification that they meet the electrical safety code in Canada. Uh, otherwise, we won't approve that reader. Uh, and uh, the other piece is the IEC or IC Canada, Industry Canada certification. So here in, in the United States, you all have FCC approval for uh, radio frequency uh, output. In, in Canada, it's analogous. It's Industry Canada that does that. Uh, they're analogous in that they do similar things, but we don't respect the FCC uh, approval. You need to have the Industry Canada sticker on there. So it's anything wireless, it's baby monitors, it's garage door openers, anything that sends out a, a signal is regulated by Industry Canada. Uh, and then the last thing is we just uh, make sure that the, the reader is safe. Uh, we stick it underneath the running water to make sure that uh, it's reasonably robust and that it's not going to electrocute anybody, and then you get to go on the list. UHF, there's been lots of discussion about UHF. I probably get uh, a call a month about UHF. Um, I'm the SOB in Canada that some people think are blocking the implementation of UHF in Canada, but uh, I'm not. I'm, I'm open to this. Uh, we've done our own trials with UHF. Uh, so in Canada, we, we, we use uh, low frequency. Uh, we don't have uh, any standards available uh, that would um, uh, fit with UHF. Uh, there's EPC Gen 2 and, and ISO 18006 uh, standards for item level stuff, but it's not particular to um, livestock uh, identification. So <clears throat> until standards are here, um, you know, we'll, we'll just hold, hold on to uh, uh, the, the standard we have with low frequency and um, uh, wait to see what happens. So, as mentioned earlier, I, I do sit on Working Group 3, and recently Working Group 3 has decided that uh, there's enough discussion about UHF in Animal ID that there needs to be a standard developed. The United States, uh, I think USDA, uh, had some proposed uh, standards for uh, UHF in numbering schemes, and that has... Uh, generated uh, movement uh, at this committee level. So within the ISO scheme of things, um, the animal ID was all low frequency. There was a separate ISO committee for UHF. And so they did boxes at Walmart and tractor trailer tracking and stuff like that. And the concern was there's, there's jurisdictional lines uh, in the standards development pieces. And the, the, the leaders on our committee were afraid that these folks who develop UHF standards for boxes and cases would now take on the animal ID part. So there was an agreement reached uh, that, you know, we would carve off uh, UHF standards for animal ID and, and leave them to do what they know best. So 
Um, we have a project team uh, who is working on uh, a standard right now. It's called Numbering Schemes for UHF. Uh, there's been the last conference call was in, it was Labor Day. <laughs> I guess they don't have Labor Day in Europe. Uh, it's a very you know, Eurocentric group, but um, the, the standard has started. Uh, the discussion has started. And for the amount of time I've been at uh, uh, Working Group 3, uh, this is the fastest moving standard I've seen yet. Um, there's some standards that were started before I got there that are still struggling along. Um, I, I don't know how long it's going to take to finish this one. It, my, if I was a betting man, I'd say one to five years. I know there's some other uh, best guesses at that, but um, it's, it, the consensus building is... Uh, takes the longest. So we have people from all around the world at the table. There's people that have specific interest in UHF who are around the table, uh, uh, meaning uh, administrators of systems, so the folks in Australia, uh, folks in Canada, the folks in Quebec, uh, and, and certainly a number of folks from uh, uh, the EU who are adding input to, uh, you know, what do we need in a numbering scheme and, and how is this going to work with existing numbering schemes. So that was one of uh, America's, uh, I think, concerns was that the, the standard uh, may change the way numbering schemes are done here. And so that's all being taken into uh, account. So it's, it's moving forward. Uh, I'm, like I said, I'm one to five years, I bet. Um, what's the value in standards, Canadian standards? And how does this, how does this benefit the system? I think it's important to understand uh, that with low frequency, we have a platform of uh, technology. We have tags, we have microchips, uh, we have the ability to read boluses, although boluses aren't approved in Canada. So an animal that takes sick at a fair can be transported to the vet clinic and the vet can scan that, that animal with the same reader that he uses to scan dogs and cats. So the interoperability is important uh, on all those. And, uh, you know, some other uh, um, devices don't have that full platform, so you'll end up with a cattle tag for uh, one thing, but, you know, microchips or, or implants uh, or, or small-scale uh, transponders will have to be a different technology. And now you're into two readers or multiple readers. So I think it's important to understand <clears throat> that's one of the benefits of low frequency is this platform that, that has all these modalities of, of ID on it. So it, it ensures, these standards ensure uh, consistency of essential features. So uh, stuff like quality and reliability and performance compatibility. So we test for all that in our standards. So there's an there's a ISO standard, uh, f which is the basis of, of the manufactured product. There's an ICAR standard that is an international body that tests tags and approves them. And, and the Canadian standard takes that a little bit higher. So like I mentioned, the minus 35 piece, um, there's not too many other jurisdictions, not even Sweden, uh, that we talked to worried about cold weather tagging. But um, if you've ever tagged, even at minus 20, uh, and I'm talking Celsius, sorry, um, if you, even if you tag uh, well within that spec, uh, it, it can be uh, quite difficult because the tags are plastic and, and uh, the plastic needs to stretch when you put that together. So it's, uh, it, it's important in our uh, jurisdiction to have a standard that works uh, for our industry. It drives manufacturers crazy that they need to meet a second spec when they come to our country, but uh, it, it is what it is. So it also helps in the development and the manufacturing uh, of, of products. So if um, the, the standard's in place, it's been in place for a long time, and uh, if a manufacturer wants to make a new batch of tags, they don't have to call up and say, you know, are, are we still doing 134? Yep, okay, good. They, they can just, production happens, tags, supply show up, and the system runs as it should. So what's the value proposition? So allowing that single technology or device across the system uh, helps to lower cost. It focuses everybody on one particular product. It, it helps with uh, supply of product. So when Canada and, and folks down here are going to face that same uh, issue, maybe not as bad, but it, it, if all of a sudden 
there is a, uh, a program starting and there's a huge demand for tags, it's um, the, the market will get filled faster if it's at the same standard as the manufacturers are selling globally because they can pull product from around the world to fill demand. So when Canada moved from barcoded tags into uh, radio frequency tags, there was basically one company who could meet that need and fill that market up uh, to meet that demand. And uh, it, it, it slowed down the, the program, but, uh, you know, there's a handful of, of vendors who just couldn't catch up. They could not produce enough tags fast enough to fill all the orders. And, of course, the retailers would order from everybody, and who's ever tag showed up, they'd cancel the rest. But uh, it, it, was, uh, it hobbled the system for, for a little while. It also sets a minimum uh, uh, expectation for performance and conformance and longevity uh, and quality. So in our testing, we have field tests and lab tests. Uh, we demand uh, a one-year tag retention trial with a 95 percent, uh, uh, um, uh, I can't remember the exact terminology. It's a statistical uh, statement in there about uh, uh, the validity of the data, uh, statistical relevance. So you need to have um, uh, enough tags out there uh, for a year and, uh, and, and meet that 99% retention rate before that tag will, will pass uh, our, uh, uh, our standard. We also have um, performance uh, specs for read range and uh, on axis, off axis. So it, uh, it allows uh, us to uh, feel uh, comfortable that tags that are approved are uh, going to meet the needs of our system. So it also allows this process to test conformance and performance of tags. It, it keeps inferior tags uh, out of the system. As I said, we, met, we, uh, we test tags every year and, um, or every year and a half. We make sure that they, the tags are the same tags that were approved originally. Uh, we make sure that uh, you know, things haven't changed to the point where the tags are not meeting uh, our specification any longer. And uh, it also provides a process for us to remove non-performing uh, or conforming product. Uh, the um, uh, tags that, uh, and, and we're not, you know, uh, we're not harsh. If your tag's not meeting the, the specification, we'll sit down and have a conversation. And depending on the answer, uh, you know, we'll work with you to get your tag back up to spec. And, you know, we've uh, tested uh, this last round of testing. We had one tag that was out of spec, and, and we sat with the manufacturer, and they, they showed us, uh, you know, why uh, the, the, the uh, lab test didn't work, and uh, we believe them, and, uh, you know, we'll wait till the next round. We have another tag that uh, failed miserably, and, um, uh, you know, they got a letter, and we're just working through that process now. So uh, the system works, and uh, it uh, allows vendors um, – there's transparency there, so vendors know what to expect, and uh, it keeps everyone uh, calm. So I think the bottom line here is that standards, uh, with respect to the Canadian system, offer confidence in the system, right? It's, it's uh, this transparent uh, process that, uh, you know, people can uh, use or uh, test to, and before they even show up at my door with a new tag, they'll know whether their tag is going to meet uh, our standards or not. So uh, uh, governments and uh, industry people uh, and manufacturers in, with, that all work within our system, uh, I think, have a higher level of confidence because we do have uh, minimum levels and standards for things, and uh, we enforce those. So. That's my presentation. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, it's, a, it's an honor to stand up here in front of you folks. Thank you.